when you look at adoption, there's so much that happens outside of the actual software. And one of the biggest things that I have seen is when we can really lead with the why and helping people understand what it is that where we're going and what we need to do, and then let something like the software just be a byproduct of how we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. It's so much different than just starting with, here's what we're doing and we're going to jam it down your throat. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure we have a message that we're doing this for and with you, not to you. Mm-hmm. And here's why we're doing this for you and with you and why we need to get to where we're going to be. But we do need to make sure that here's the four corners of the box. This is going to make our life a lot easier. You're listening to Rob's Champions, a podcast created for B2B leaders to help you align your people, streamline your processes, trust your data, and leverage technology in order to grow your business. We're your hosts, Brendan Denable, CEO and co-founder of Dynamico. And Amy Weaver, Dynamico's marketing director. Let's jump in first with the reason I invited you to be here, Alan. We worked together a long time ago. It's probably been 10 10 years years since we've seen each other like in real life, which is terrible. But back then, I was the leader of our marketing team at Magnus Health, a little SaaS startup in Raleigh. And you, you held a couple of titles there, but the last one was chief product officer. And I would argue you were kind of a chief revenue officer just like before that was a thing. And then... Since then, you co-founded some other businesses and now have transitioned to this certified EOS implementer. So can you give our audience a little bit of a background on you and how you came to be what you are today? Yeah, for sure. And uh, thanks for having me. I I think at its core, all the stuff that I've done is I learned over time that that I was very much an integrator in, in the EOS speak very much that it's kind of second in command. And if you look back over the things that I have done, that's pretty much the the role that I've served. And after about close to 10 years of running companies on EOS, on the framework of EOS, sitting largely in that integrator seat, uh, about five years ago, I transitioned over to and went and got trained and certified. And now I, I sit on the implementer side of the table with companies running on EOS. So I'm usually work with anywhere from 23, 25 companies at a time, helping them speak a common language and have all the tools to run a great business rather than having to figure out how to run a great business. And that's what kind of led me to today. What size companies do you work with typically? Brendan was asking this and I wasn't sure. If you define kind of a sweet spot, it's anywhere from 10 to 250 employees, privately okay. held businesses is a pretty typical. I mean, it certainly works outside of that, but that is uh, what would be defined as a sweet spot. Okay. Yeah. So that's pretty consistent what we hear. So Al, I'm not sure if Amy shared this with you, but you know, we've been an EOS company for a long time, but we self-implemented for the first probably eight years and then started working with an implementer two years ago which made a massive difference. So again, my PSA for right now would be if you are a company that's currently running on on EOS and you're self-implementing and you think you could maybe get a little more value, I would highly recommend working with an implementer. You know, I've been in that position before too, as as Amy mentioned, even in the the company that we work together, we were presented with that opportunity and kind of looked at it as we probably thought we're going to spend more time and energy and, and ultimately money trying to figure it out on our own. Because ultimately, you got to get there. And we were thinking, and the mindset I talk to companies now is like, do you want to spend time thinking about how to run a great business or do you just want to go run a great business? Do you want to just be a student of the game and learn this stuff as you go, learn it the right way, learn it in the right order? And how much further and how much faster can we go? I'd peel the onion back one more layer to that too. And this is kind of an EOS creed, but EOS isn't necessarily the right fit for every business, but every business should have an operating system that they're running on. Pick one and roll with it, even if EOS is not the right one for you. But you really can't run on multiple systems. you got to get everybody speaking on that common language. So if nothing else, that's the takeaway. Is And if you don't have an off-the-shelf one like an EOS or a scaling up or other options, you're kind of running your own homegrown system, even though you don't know it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're trying to motivate your team. You're trying to set goals. You're trying to have a vision. And 
And ultimately, when you're cobbling that all together, how much time and energy are you spending trying to figure it out rather than just actually running a great business? Yeah, Yeah. I guess we could say the same thing about a CRM. You know, make sure you have a CRM, pick your color. Yeah. And if you really have to do it on an Excel spreadsheet, then that, I guess, is some version. It's just not going to be quite as good as having the software that can automate a lot of the things. But Well, or scale. It's not going to work at scale. Right, exactly. But the point is, yeah, you have to have something. Yeah. So, Alan, where do you think Magnus was? I mean, it certainly wasn't at its infancy as a company, but what do you think was the catalyst for deciding on an operating system? It was a classic use case. It was around the 12 to 14 full-time employee mark, uh, if I remember correctly. I know it was certainly between 10 and 15. And that's one of the first inflection points where uh, you, you can't just cobble things together anymore as people show up, even if everything stays the same, the organization is getting more complex, just the Mm -hmm. way that human communication works. You know, there's two lines of communication between any two individuals. So as you continue to build out teams, things are going to get more complex, even if everything stays the same. That's one of the areas that we'll see. With that said, I've also specifically worked with organizations that were founded in 1905 and, you know, multi-generational family business and because of either market circumstances and needing to change and adapt or a new generational shift. They're like, we really haven't ever buckled down on this stuff and we need to do that now. Or We don't want to be the generation that this thing goes belly up under. We want to actually do the iterating and the change necessary to move the organization forward. So that is kind of a misconception, I think, with operating systems as a whole is it's not necessarily a startup thing. Mm. All stages of businesses could have some type of inflection point, whether it's th- you're starting to see some people issues or they're just throwing a lot of stuff against the wall to see what will stick. They're kind of have hit some type of ceiling and they're trying to break through some type of ceiling. And the reality of that is that once you start using an operating system, you start speaking a common language, it helps break through that ceiling. Well, guess what? There's no one ceiling. It's kind of like kids. There's growth spurts in any business. And so congratulations, you're running an organization. You just broke through a ceiling. The only reward you're going to get is there's another one coming. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, and if there's not, then that's a different problem. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So bring on the ceiling. That's right. right. Now that you are working with lots more organizations, not just internally, what are some similarities between the ones that you think are scaling effectively versus the ones that kind of struggle to break through these ceilings? Although this could be something that's pretty popular to be said, I think one of the big challenges as scale is happening is across all kinds of functional areas, not just in the revenue space. We take our best performers, individual contributors, and move them into management leadership roles with no management and leadership training. Mm. The actual leading and managing of teams is is drastically different than being a a really high-performing individual contributor. Um, And oftentimes, we've even seen when we can really get teams to be open and honest, sometimes there's a a lot of relief on both sides of a tough conversation, of a critical conversation, where people return back to the individual contributor world once they actually see what those leadership and management capabilities or needs are. So I think that that's one place that I'm sure gets talked about a lot, but the reality is we need to set people up for success and make sure they have the tools, the training, the resources necessary for that to be a logical move. I I tell a lot of times now, um, I was a integrator for almost 10 years before I became an implementer, as I said earlier. And a lot of times I hear companies talking about, well, you know, we're very unique and there's all these specific things to our industry and this is very complicated. And I say, hey, out of an abundance of love, I'm going to tell you something. If you give me six weeks in your company, I can figure all this out. I don't need to know any of that. Like, but that doesn't have any, a lot of times the subject matter and the expertise, one of the things that's been just fascinating to me is you can go from anywhere from a utility contractor to a SaaS business in the same week. And 90% of the conversation and the challenges are the exact same. Mm. And so that while there is that unique flair of what everybody does, and that probably does get complicated, and there is a lot of subject matter expertise that's needed from a leadership and management standpoint, a lot of times it's like, how are we motivating people? Are we driving to the, the right decisions? Are we making decisions appropriately? 
or we scale the organization that way. And people are a large part of what we do. So ultimately, we can see between people and, and processes and truly adhering to those, I think are the biggest drivers that, that I, would, I would at least look at as trends. Yeah, which is, to your point, is very consistent with RevOps too, yeah. And then beyond that, it goes to looking at your data, being able to trust it, and then using that to make informed decisions on what technology you're going to use to empower those employees and maybe streamline those processes, hopefully streamline those processes, I guess. I hundred percent agree with that. And if you go back to, if we simplify again, the RevOps service, marketing, sales, all kind of revenue, put it under an umbrella. And you think about what are the processes, the people, the platforms, all the things that we're using and how do we simplify that? The other thing is kind of like the matrix concept a little bit is once we get great processes, once we get great people, once we have the right platforms, and a lot of times processes can be dictated through the platforms themselves, you know, when you do this, it requires this and this requires that and like try to, you know, make it as simple to use as possible, as few mistakes as possible. The matrix concept of this is that it should all feed each other. Mm -hmm. Well, if this metric says that we're off track for the last six or eight weeks, rather than just we had one bad week, now we might be heading in the direction of needing to change a process or think about how we're doing something differently in one of our systems. Now our system kind of breaks in one way. Well, does that help us understand we need, you know, they're all interconnected in a way that once our leaders can start seeing how all of those things are rowing in the same direction mm -hmm. and trying to actually make our life easier to get done what we need to get done, that's where we can really start seeing, I think, some drastic improvements and go a lot further and go a lot faster. Yeah. What are some mistakes that you're finding organizations can make when they're going through this process with you? I want some good stuff. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. I mean, get started yesterday. When you think about it, if you have two axes, one's time and one's change. And over time, if you make incremental changes, you're going to get to the end of that graph and you're going to be in a much different place than you are today. Mm -hmm. Then if you wait six months, then you're going to be that much further behind. Yeah. So I do see that as a mistake. I see getting really overcomplicating the decision-making process. So we always kind of joke, if you look at red, yellow, and green, I would ask a team, what's the color of hell, red, yellow, or green? You start green. Who thinks the color of hell is green? Nobody. Who thinks the color of hell is yellow? Nobody. Who thinks the color of hell is red? Everybody raises their hand, right? Well, the color of hell is yellow. You know, we need a hell yes or a hell no, but we can't have <laughs> hell maybe. Okay. That's hell. And so how do we get ourselves motivated and understanding, you know what, a bad decision? Because we're going to surround ourselves with talented people. We want to have people that share our values and are going to see the direction of where we're heading. So we, when we make an assumption that we've got great people around us, bad decisions are not going to be catastrophic. They're going to be like, you know, we got it 80, 85 percent right. We can train that last 10, 15 percent the next time and make sure we don't make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. And then the the last huge mistake is just a, it's a challenge with any organization that's growing because everybody kind of thinks that this is my baby kind of concept is just let go of the vine. You know, start delegating. We got to delegate and elevate. I want to know what is your unique ability you bring to this organization and why can't we have more of your time doing that? Mm -hmm. I had a CEO of a hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of organization and we uncovered that Tuesday through Friday every week he spends about an hour to go get the mail. I was like, that door is locked. And before we leave today, that door will not be unlocked until you agree you're no longer going to do that. But <laughs> Not because it's, you know, oftentimes people do this totally with the good intentions of, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't want someone else to have to do this or I've done it for a long time. Or, hey, every now and then there's a big check in there and I like seeing it, you know, like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that that's where I, you know, this team needs your time being used. Yeah. So making sure we really are properly delegating to elevate not only yourself, but the team yeah. is something that people just, they just hold on to. Again, not for wrong, you know, bad intentions, but we got to help people see that and help people need to raise their hand and help each other too. This is one area that I've really found. Hey, Amy, you know, I got it. You know, let go of the vine. You're like, okay, I trust you. Like, but sometimes oh we need God. that reinforcement from others. I know when you, I can think specifically of a time when you did this to me and I hated you for it at the time. We were going to implement HubSpot 
this was late 2011, had to be beginning of 2012. And you wanted me to negotiate the pricing with a rep. You're like, no, 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 don't take that first price. Go back and say, look, we're a startup. We're like really strapped for cash. Like, what can you do? You know, end of the quarter is coming up. What can you do? And I'm like, I can't have that conversation. What are you getting? It was, I could have killed you. <laughs> How'd you it did, do make, it? it did make me feel good that you thought I could handle it and I got us a better deal. <laughs> I got us a better deal. It's a great point, though, that this goes back to kind of the leadership and management aspects of it, too. And I think this is a great, fun, open, and honest conversation. Amy will tell you just as quickly as I will. We had some hard conversations, too, right? Yeah. But I always would challenge people that I know and I, I believe in to say, look, we've got to get our relationship to where if I'm about to make some bonehead move, I want you to pull me in that conference room. You can cuss me out. You can tell me whatever you need. And but and I, I think you'll still confirm this when she did that, when other people that I counted on did that, I'm going to give them a hug. I'm going to thank them. I'm going to tell them, hey, I might need tonight to think about it. But you're right. Yeah, let's figure out how to make this work. And when you when you start helping people understand that you, you believe in them, it's not just that you trust them, it's you believe. Why are you going to do this? Because that's a skill that I want you to put on your on your resume because, and that's, and that's, I need to be able to count on for those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. And oftentimes that's more leadership to me than holding things and trying to be the bottleneck and the gatekeeper of like, you know, well, that's all got to go through me. And I don't know if that's a confidence thing uh, with leaders these days that think that if, you know, that creates some kind of leverage, which think about that word in itself, that's a terrible word if you're thinking about being a, a leader, manager, and organization, and you want quite the opposite. I mean, I've got, I teach teams this now. I, I say, if I had two hours after practice and I could go to the gym and I'm a basketball player and I've got two hours, every day I'm going to shoot free throws. I'm going to shoot a thousand free throws after practice is over, a thousand more than anybody. And I'm going to take my free throw percentage from 82 or 83% up to like 91, 92%. I'm pretty, I'd be one of the top free throw shooters in the country. But at the end of the game, the opposing team knows that they're not going to foul me. Hmm. They're going to foul any of the other four players on the court because they're shooting 60, 65, 70% from the line. Mm -hmm. I want you to take those two hours that you got that you can go to the gym. I want you to invest it in the other four starters on the team. I want everybody to shoot 80% from the line. I might shoot 82, 83% from the line. But if my other teammates can shoot 80% from the line, you can't foul any of us at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. All we got to do is get the ball in bounds. We're all going to make that shot. So if you think about that from a business standpoint, it's really powerful that from leadership and management, let's reinvest in the team. I should be judged if I'm a leader by the, by the outcomes of the teams that I lead. And I can't do that alone. That's why mm -hmm. I, there wouldn't be any people if you could do it all alone. So that mindset shift. And I mean, I think all this is hugely applicable just in the RevOps world because I just look at that as like all of that leadership management's required to run a great revenue operation. Yep. The revenue operation is is just probably the one that has the most clear data and measurables and things that is so is so black and white. Like let's embrace that, let's live into it, and let's go crush it. Well, and it's your customer facing teams that we're talking about. So the customer is on the receiving end of these people who are motivated and empowered and really excelling in their roles. So they're going to appreciate that too. Yep. 100%. Improve the customer experience. Yeah. I like the basketball analogy. <laughs> You know, because uh, you've been keeping up with the Minnesota Timberwolves, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you think about it, I, you know, I don't follow basketball much as much as you do, apparently. But exactly, you know, where I grew up, it wasn't that big a sport. But of course, when the Timberwolves are in the playoffs, you know, I'm going to be watching. Everybody's got to care now. Yeah. And on Sunday night, I mean, you know, they beat the Nuggets for the exact reason that you just gave. And again, myself, not really knowing basketball, I, I came out on, on Monday and was saying to a few of the guys who were like totally into it, I'm like, they won because they played as a team. The points were spread across, you know, all the players in the team, whereas the Nuggets, 80% of their points were scored by two players. That's going to that's, that's gonna get you in the end, you know? At some point. Yeah, at some point, that's going to break down. And if you translate that into the business world, often what that means is we are kind of masking behind maybe we have a people issue or something that we need to deal with 
and really comes from a delegation standpoint as of when you're leading. There's really two two big delegation challenges. One is we just literally don't have anybody to delegate to. There's not the resource there. Like that's like a hiring decision or resource allocation. We the team's growing, we're scaling back to one of your original questions, Amy, you know, do we have the processes, the systems in place that help us better proactively predict that it's time to hire so we we can offload those things. Mm -hmm. The second one is one we really have to watch out for more, which is we actually have the person, we have the role. We're just unwilling to actually delegate to them. Because we, there's not a trust, there's not the trust, there's not the thought that it's actually going to get done. And that's probably more of a people issue than it is a delegation issue. Mm-hmm. And, you know, A players want to surround themselves with A players. And ultimately, as leaders and as managers, the one decision, the one difference, excuse me, I let the cat out of the bag here, is that, you know, we're just expected to make decisions. Everybody else can see the same things that we can. If there's someone that's underperforming or system that's underperforming, a process that's underperforming, Everybody else sees it, too. It's just a leader's job is to actually do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. What are some other Magnus stories that we can come back to to tie into whether it's challenges with growing headcount or this could be a good direction to go, like keeping the teams aligned as you're growing and adding people? What do you remember about when we had some of those rougher patches? I think speaking specifically to the keeping teams aligned, it's remarkable how internally, how often things can go so far apart when we're saying the same thing. When you think about clarity, there's some tools here, but oftentimes we start with facts and those facts, we then create kind of stories in our mind about based on the facts. The stories lead us to how we feel about what's happening. And then ultimately it's that's expectations. But the interesting thing here is you go back to the facts, even internally in a team, we're aligning around, hey, these are the same facts, but this is actually the way that I see it. And this is the way that you see it. So we're not, we don't even start by truly aligning around the facts. And then the, what you're speaking to in our experience together, classic example is kind of, you've got a customer success, customer support team, implementation team, and you've got a software engineering team. And we've got customers saying that, the way that something's not working well, and they're taking this on the front lines every day. Mm -hmm. Well, I wish it did this or it should have done that. And then, you know, we're trying to say, hey, go back to our engineering team. Internally, we're kind of having this strife or or debate on whether this is a new feature request or this is a bug or this. And and what we need to be doing is saying, hey, guys, we're on the same team. It doesn't really matter. We can retrospectively go back and look at that. The reality is, even if we had every spec right and it was coded exactly to the spec and now we put it out in the market, we just we got it a little wrong. Mm-hmm. Now we need to align together and fix the challenge on behalf of the client, but then also go back retrospectively and think about, well, how are we going to make sure that we do this better next time? Where did things slip through the cracks? And any cross-functional, cross-departmental kind of issue in organizations has the opportunity for it to be come back to that. Are we aligning around what we actually think the facts are to start moving forward? Were there any circumstances of implementing technology and not getting the adoption that we'd hoped for? I sort of have one in mind, and I'm wondering if you remember it the same way. We got a sales director that was very vocal about implementing Salesforce. And I don't know that it went super smoothly. I don't know how you felt about it at the time. Adoption certainly is is everything. It's interesting to think back. So this is probably a circa 2010, 11-ish timeframe at this point. And the decision back then, Salesforce and HubSpot were very different tools. You know, very. Um, yeah, they wouldn't HubSpot have been the same, was very much. Yeah, they weren't in the same universe. Yeah. Yeah. And it would be very common that you'd have an integration between Salesforce and HubSpot. HubSpot for marketing automation, Salesforce coming out of the gate as, as very much the CRM tool, whereas it's probably much more of a head to head decision. Although there are teams that still use both, too. And that's that there's totally use cases for that. So the reason that I'm pointing that out is it was also back to the, well, we're adding one more tool to the suite kind of conversation, which is still Mm -hmm. relevant today. You know, not Mm -hmm. just in the CRM world, but as you add Slack and, you know, everything, it's like 
there's the timeless debate of can we put everything in one place or is there just these specific things that work great for specific things? And it's always a challenge. I think that the when you look at adoption, there's so much that happens outside of the actual software. And one of the biggest things that I have seen is when we can really lead with the why and helping people understand what it is that where we're going and what we need to do, and then let something like the software just be a byproduct of how we're going to get there. Mm-hmm. It's so much different than just starting with, here's what we're doing and we're going to jam it down your throat. Mm-hmm. We want to make sure we have a message that we're doing this for and with you, not to you. Mm-hmm. And here's why we're doing this for you and with you and why we need to get to where we're going to be. But we do need to make sure that here's the four corners of the box. This is going to make our life a lot easier. So hopefully that speaks to it directly. I I do remember exactly what you're saying. And that was probably the other factor that's worth throwing in is not only was it a move to Salesforce, but it was probably a move from Zoho to Pipedrive to Capsule CRM to to this and it's like wasn't sugar in there (laughs) sugar yeah sugar crm for sure and it was and so it's also the here we go again yeah that you have to really make sure you're very strategic and intentional you know whether it's this situation or anything in a growing organization the way i like to look back is to say look so whether it's this software this process the system let's give a little bit of credit that two or three years ago when we made this decision There were probably some things limiting why we made the decision. There were reasons. There were smart people around the table. So rather than all having the mindset now of saying, all right, well, we got to, here we go again. We got to change something. We've got to add something new. Rather than saying there was a bunch of boneheads and this was a dumb decision, why don't we look at it and say, let's respect and applaud the fact that these decisions and these systems got us four years down the road. Mm. But at the same time, know and acknowledge that they're not going to get us to the future. Starting with the leaders that made, hey, I fully embrace that too. I'm glad y'all are poking holes in this now, but can't you see that we're at a, we've grown revenue four times what it was when we started with this. Yeah, Absolutely, we're going to outgrow it. Absolutely, there's some duct tape and strings right now. And let's applaud that. Let's respect it. And let's say that the reason that we're here is because decisions like this actually allow us to get to this point. Now let's align around how we can even get better and and move faster. Yeah, I knew I could count on you for a positive outlook on that. It's always half full. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's really good. The why the why is really critical in, in explaining both the past, you know, why you did things before and why you're making that change now and, you know, how everybody benefits and you know, one of the big focuses for us this year, kind of our theme for the year at Dynamico, in fact, is all around, well, it's, in fact, it's very much around what you've said already a number of times around progress, not perfection. You know that progress, not perfection kills me, but it's, you know, yeah. it's making me better to go through this process of making the podcast and doing the thing and, you know, making it better as doing we go. Doing the uncomfortable work that's necessary. Yeah. When you think about progress over perfection and you think about motivating people and stepping out of your comfort zone, and the, it, Brene Brown kind of nails it here, too. I, I'm a big Brene Brown fan. And she says that clear is kind and unclear is unkind. I mean, how cool is that? Mm. It's like you don't have to be you don't have to deliver potentially even bad news or a potential improvement in a negative way. You don't have to be rude about it. You just need to be clear. And if we can take that mindset of progress over perfection, we can make sure we're being clear with each other. The reality is so many teams need to become more open and honest with each other and just more cohesive because, quite frankly, they're not. And when they are, then all of these other things around aligning with tools and software changes and process changes, even we can't rule by consensus, but we want everybody to have participated to make sure that their voice has been heard in a way that when we have kind of, you know, what I would refer to and we talk about as healthy conflict in organizations, which organizations crave that. They crave having healthy conflict because, you know, if one of us could just make all the decisions, great. But, you know, we have all these unique perspectives and ways that we view our organizations and how we can improve. And when we all lean into those tough conversations, we're going to get so much better of a result than trying to have some kind of dictatorship. Yeah. But also, if you're not having conflict, you're most likely not pushing hard enough to reaching whatever your 
goals are for the whether it's the quarter or the year or whatever it is. And hey, so sales is a perfect example. We're going to go out and celebrate that this quarter, 95% of our contracts are won. Time to increase your price. <laughs> <laughs> There's some good and bad in that. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, let's, again, go back to the data, make sure we understand what it's telling us, but we don't want to be in the total fish shooting fish in a barrel kind of world. You know, we want to make sure that we're properly valued in, in the market. Yeah, especially in yeah. the services business. Amy, that's actually a good one to include in our discussion with Casey, right? That's a great tee up for her next week. Yeah, we're talking to a pricing strategist pro next week. Yeah, that's a really good one. You're welcome, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good. I love this thing that I heard yesterday for the first time, and I was kind of shocked that I hadn't heard it before, that all leadership is temporary. Have you heard that before, Alan? I hadn't heard it in those terms, but I can get behind that. Yeah, because it's around a sort of a delegate and elevate conversation. And my friend, John Rodriguez, who said this, he was going into, and again, it was an EOS type conversation because the person who'd raised the issue is an EOS company. So she was using all the terms that you would use. And he just was explaining to her how this was going to work. And he just sort of fleetingly said, and you know, all leadership is temporary. And I'm like, that's brilliant, you know, because, and in fact, I heard a, an example of that just this morning where this is how AI is going to change what we're doing as leaders, but more of us are going to be becoming leaders or managers because we're going to be managing, instead of managing more people, we're going to be managing our AI that's going to be helping us do our job better, which again means that what we're doing today or next week or this month from a leadership perspective is different to what it's going to be next month or next year. And if it's not, then we're clearly not pushing hard enough or we're not growing as an individual, as a professional. So I was just wondering whether you'd heard that one before, because it's, I think it fits really well in that delegate and elevate conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, it can directly relate to something I do talk to teams a lot about, which in that is growth lives on the right on the other side of fear and change. So Let's buckle up and let's just get better at that. And let's lean into some tough conversations when, when call each other out on that, but do it in a way that we're all in this together. It's not personal attacks. It's that we need to grow and lean in and be a little uncomfortable and really we'll see that it's not that bad. Yeah. I heard a really another good explanation recently for what you were talking about earlier, where when someone who has really high value things that they could be doing, but they're instead going to get the mail, which takes them four hours a week. A really good way to present that, which in fact is a, if you think about it, is a really data driven way, is have a conversation with them and say, well, if you could get four hours a week back or multiply that by the weeks in the year, so 50 times four is 200 hours a year, how could you use those 200 hours a year to a higher value for the business? 100%. And that's, so you take it from, it's always more powerful when you say, well, stop doing that. Instead of saying, stop doing that, stop doing that and start doing this, because that's all people really need, because it's often fear that is keeping them doing that. So if you could tell them what to start doing instead of just stop doing, it's much easier for them to make that shift. Yeah, and that's definitely a decision more in fear and scarcity than we speak in EOS a lot about love and abundance. Yeah. You know, if we're abundance minded, we're doing this with love. And sometimes love is delivering some tough news to somebody, yep. you know, yeah. hey, man. You know, we do need you to stop getting the mail, but it's because we also at the same time here, let's say it's a, you know, let's go back to sales and I'm not getting enough time to do this, not, but I love this or I'm great at it. We also, well, you're better at that than anybody in the organization. What if we could have 10, 20, 30% more of your time doing that? Mm -hmm. Sign me up. I'm selfishly going to be in a better place. You're going to be in a better place. We're going to be in a better place if we can get us all aligned and making sure that that's where we're spending our time and energy. Yeah, which I think actually speaks directly. I've, I've seen this many times myself to an example you gave earlier about when people go from being an individual contributor to being a, put in a, the position of a manager or a leader when they're not really ready because they haven't been trained to do that. And then in fact, if they have a really good leader, that leader will manage them back to becoming an individual contributor because they're so good at doing that thing. But, you know, often people have to try things for themselves and before they can realize it. And not everybody's open to the coaching to go through that process of, because it, 
what they were doing it potentially because they thought that was what more success looks like. But in fact, coming back to the unique ability that, that we all have, that's not always the case. You know, some of us are just better at being individual contributors than we are to being leaders or managers. Yeah. 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 And the reality of a lot of those decisions are that we haven't done a great job in organizations of showing career pathing that potentially. And so, in other words, it's that there's a perception that if I move into leadership and management, there's additional compensation. And that's kind of the that's the track that I should be on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did this. Now I should do this. And and that's not always often the case. It's it's very different things. Yeah. And of, of course, it's even more difficult than those you know smaller companies up to 20, 30 people, it's really hard to have a clear career path. So there's got to be a lot more trust. Or like one of our previous guests was saying, no one has ever retired from a career in social media. This was a gal who's the head of growth at a social media agency. And I had never considered that before. But if it's not a traditional career path that's kind of laid out before you, of first you do this role and then you transition to this and then you lead a team of people who are doing this, then what can that look like? Yeah. And I guess AI will be the next thing, right? I mean, how do you retire from AI? I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's never going to happen if that's your role in the business. It, it'll be interesting to see. Obviously, there's a lot of dialogue around it right now. There's a, a lot of what ifs. I am can admit what, probably a weakness that I don't do well in the what if worlds. I kind of like more of the here and now, what can we control and what can we get better at? But if nothing else, I think there's an agreement that there will still be a lot of opportunity for people that just know how to use AI very well. I don't think it will go take over and conquer the world. And so then we, none of us will be here. So who cares? You know, I'm the type of person that I'm not going to have my storage underground storage bunker for the arm again, because if I just take me out at that point, I'm, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which again, it comes back to that, the mindset, right? It's, one of abundance versus scarcity, you know, and I guess, well, I mean, Amy's probably heard me say this once too many times, but I say today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be better than today. And a lot of that is because of technology. And of course, right now, more specifically AI, but I truly believe that. I agree there. That's good. Amy, what else do we have for, for Alan? Do you have any advice for folks who are reaching an inflection point? Let's say that where they're debating, do we need an operating system? Do we need some sort of process in place to move forward and to scale efficiently? Do you have advice for who the stakeholders are that need to be having those conversations or what do they need to be asking one another to you know, move forward, I guess? Well, it certainly is a type thing that has to start, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a little bit of a top down with all the critical stakeholders. If the biggest flaw that I've seen is that if there's not buy-in in the room, it's not going to work. It's not worth the investment of the time and energy and capital, human capital and money to do it. But at the same time, hopefully people can look inward a little bit and say, God, what if we just got out of our own way? This is actually a great compliment to the team. If we just got out of our own way a little bit, if we just had a little bit more structure, a little bit more discipline, a little bit more consistency, if we were all you know, on the same sheet of music, if we really were rowing in the same inner direction, if all of our human energy was pointing in the same direction, man, how much better would that feel? Mm-hmm. And at that point, it's more just giving in and embracing the process, the framework, and letting it guide you. I ultimately think of it as with the teams that I do work with, I tell them all the time, our job is to, at the end of the day, for you to have 100% transparency of what's going on in your organization via this process, via this framework. But in my case, EOS, incapable of making a hard decision. It's not able to do that. Mm -hmm. You've got to do that. You've got Mm -hmm. to lean in and embrace that. And sometimes, especially in the kind of high growth world, the other kind of check our ego at the door moment is, is sometimes as we get on the same sheet of music and we're seeing what customers are telling us, maybe it's not exactly what we thought it was going to be. Maybe it requires a little bit of a pivot or a little bit of a change. And one real unfortunate thing is to see teams kind of drive that, you know, no, this is who we are. This is what we deliver in the market. This is what the world wants when the world's telling us it needs something a little bit different. Mm-hmm. But the transparency around having the open and honest conversations around collecting the data around having the right processes is telling something a little bit different. I want to give the teams the ability to kind of choose courage over comfort there. Let's go and 
make sure that on the other side of fear is the growth that we're looking for and let's go tackle it. So would the one health record switch to the student health record be an example of that happening? Oh, 100%. Magnus was the product of a huge pivot an absolute like gut wrenching check your ego at the door. Like, yeah, you kind of got this wrong, but you got an opportunity to salvage it in, in a very positive way. So I think that happened pretty shortly before I joined. Yeah, that's right. So Magnus, when I worked there, was a student health record and our target audience was private schools, mostly, who were collecting student health data and then storing it in this HIPAA-compliant way. But prior to that, Alan, how would you describe how you guys came to market? Yeah, the original concept was it's going to be more of a personal health record. This is back in, if you can rewind back to 2006, 2007, Google Health, Microsoft Health Vault were products. This is before Obama's in office. There's some talk as interesting as like socialized medicine and there's going to be chips in our elbows before you know it, all this kind of stuff. And then 2007, 2008 hits recession. And we happen to have a school come to us and say, based on the way that this system works, where you're going to collect information for individuals so that their doctors could collaborate in their care. We have the same kind of challenge for our students in our schools where we need the nurse to collaborate. We need parents to collaborate. We need to have things off campus in an emergency. It seems like that this could work for us. And between us friends here on the podcast, behind the scenes, we're kind of like, well, will you pay us for it? <laughs> and they're like, How yeah. How much are we talking about? They're here? like, yeah, there's value here. We're like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. <laughs> Obviously, you know, generalized and being a little sarcastic, but sure. fast forward. Nine to 12 months later, and we had signed up over 200 school programs, and we had totally pivoted into a new business model altogether. Now, the point here would have been we could have very easily said, no, nah, nah, you know, that's we're going to keep driving. And we had this idea we're going to make it work. But we had some tough conversations and kind of check your ego. And was, uh, this is probably in the best interest of the organization. And it, and it proved to be a really good decision in the long run for us. Yeah. Hmm. So of the six areas within EOS, and maybe sort of skip traction, even yeah. though that's ultimately the way we all want to get to. So if you look across, so you're sort of rotating 20 to 25 clients that you're working with at any one time over the last, has it been five years, you say? Mm -hmm. So you've probably, over that time, you've probably worked with maybe 50 or more clients. That's right. Where do you see the most common challenges in your sort of annual and quarterly meetings in which of those areas is it people is it data is it process where do you see the most sort of repeat issues come up it certainly ebbs and flows and every organization is a little different however there is a big theme that are the most painful things come back to people i will say a couple of things that are very positive because when i think there's a misconception here when i say that that immediately that goes to okay well we got to clean the house we got to fire everybody we got to start and that's not it at all oftentimes I'm able to help teams realize that they've actually surrounded themselves with great people. They've just done a really poor job of telling what they're accountable for, you know, who's accountable for what and why, and really aligning around accountability and responsibility. Accountability and responsibility are very different to me. One person, only one person can be accountable. Many people can be responsible. But if two people are accountable, nobody's accountable. So how do we truly make sure everybody understands what you're accountable for, what you're responsible for, align the team around the structure that we need to make the organization be successful. And then we need to go do those things and go conquer the world, make our little dent in the world. So what if you could just make one strong people move every quarter? Think about how different that would feel for a department, for a team, for a leadership team, every, you know, a year from now, 12 months, 18 months from now. And a strong people move doesn't, again, mean that you have to terminate somebody. It means you could promote somebody. It means you could recruit somebody externally that's a great fit for the organization. It means we might have somebody internal to the organization that we've got in a totally wrong role that we put in the right role and they just totally flourish in that. All of those are strong people moves. So if we can commit to making sure we have made it very clear what success looks like, what the expectations are, then we just go make sure that they're meeting or exceeding those expectations. That's how we can really start rolling the same direction. And then process would probably be the next most common. And the message I would want to send on process is it's just more fun to run a business that's process driven. 
It really is. When you can look around and you can see that everybody's doing things the same way. Now, we live by the rule of 20% documentation to get 80% of the results. I'm not entrepreneurial operating system. Entrepreneurial is in there for a reason. I don't want an 800-page manual that nobody's going to read. I want the non-negotiables. And you know what? The, the last 20%, my job is to surround you with great people. So go get it done. You'll figure out how to get it done. And ultimately, if we can align around, let's say, the customer experience comes first and we want to wow the customer with a great experience, well, you know, make that last 20%, whatever you need to do to deliver the great experience, but you followed all the steps to get there. I'll get on a plane to California tomorrow and support that if I have to with one of the clients that we're supporting. So lean in. Teams often still, even in the process, six months, a year down. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did that process. All right, show it to me. Like, what do you mean show it to you? Where's it documented? Uh, well, no, we, we like people sit over my shoulder for two days and then they learn the process. Well, that's like a game of telephone, you know, by the time that it gets down to all the individual contributors and everybody's doing things a little bit differently. Truly document your processes. I promise you, it'll be more fun to run an organization when you can look around and like, golly, that's exactly the way that we want to do it. It's because we're following our process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It gives more confidence to the end users, to the customers too, as well. Man, these people are sharp. They know their stuff, but it seems like they're really guiding us through or, you know, that's an external version of a process. And internally, even as new Contributors are coming on. We're onboarding new people. Same thing. Hey, honey, how was your day today? Yeah, it was great. It seems like these people got their act together. You know, like, <laughs> wow, the first week's filled out. The next month's filled out. Like, and I'm learning stuff. And they seem like they're really aligned around what it takes to get this job done. I'm liking what I'm hearing so far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which we often talk about that example. You cannot provide the best customer experience until you have the best employee experience. And that same person who comes home and says, hey, honey, you know, this was awesome at the Sunday barbecue or wherever they get together with their friends, where ultimately everyone, you know, starts talking about how things at work. The person who says, oh, it's amazing. I've got the processes are are awesome. They're not saying it in these terms, obviously, but (laughs) and I have all the tools I need to do my job properly. The people listening who don't have that are going oh my God, my job sucks. I need to look for another job. You know, to me, those are real examples of what happens and why people are looking for a new place to work. I think one thing to add on to that too with process that I see as a challenge is that oftentimes it gets punted or it's on people's to-do list, specifically speaking of leaders. Leaders feel like that it's their job to write and document all these processes. Bring in your individual contributors. Bring in the team members that are doing this all day, every day. Yeah. Let them draft the first versions. And leaders are often great at taking something from 80% to 100%. But these are great opportunities to start, again, embracing folks and telling them, here's why we need to do this. And I'm leaning on you to help us get to where this is going to be more standardized, not only for you, but for the next person that comes. I need your help here. I need you to lean in on that. And if you think you've ultimately, oftentimes leaders are the ones that have made hiring decisions. So Support your hiring decision and give them the opportunity to really thrive in the environment. I guess for me, it was always fun and rewarding to see that. But a lot of people hold on to, you know, well, they're not ready for that. They're not ready for that. Well, then do we have a people issue or do we have more holding on and have a control issue? Let's let them try to thrive. Because if I know that I'm, you know, can embrace and be empowered to do something as an individual contributor, man, that makes me feel a lot better than just sitting here and kind of checking check boxes all day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's actually one, that's probably, you know, the one word of advice that I give folks that I meet who are self-implementing or are looking at starting with the EOS, but are looking at self-implementing. One of the things that we probably wasted a lot of time, you know, going back to your curve of change and time that we would have been further ahead if we'd done it earlier, coming when it came to process is, I think, companies that are self-implementing. And the quickest way to find out is to say, well, how many core processes do you have in your business? And they'll go, what? I'm like, yeah, so we have 11 core processes in our in our business, which again, we figured out eight years later than we should have, but now we have them is, because if you, you know that if they don't know what their, how many core processes they have, clearly they don't have their processes for marketing or sales or anything else, if they don't actually know how many core processes they have to run their business. Because anyway, that's so that's kind of the one question I always ask. And if, and if you don't know what your core processes are and therefore how many you have, then you're probably not doing the work to make sure you actually know what each one is, even if you're using the 2080 rule, which I can highly recommend because it's so much easier to start 
with 20% and then iterate over time. Yeah, the thing you're hitting on here, and this might be a kind of way to wrap a lot of stuff up, is whether we're talking RevOps, whether we're talking an EOS or an operating system, whether you're talking a HubSpot or a automation or CRM system, all of these things are great decisions. But at the end of the day, we got to do the work. Yeah. HubSpot's great if you set it up right. EOS is great if you build your core processes and all the things that it tells you to do. All of these things are great if we lean in and do the work. And sometimes we find ourselves just sitting around the table talking kind of in circles or beating a dead horse when, hey, I need to be able to help a team step back and take the 20,000, 30,000 foot look and say, just do the work. You can't write a check to HubSpot. You can't write a check to an implementer. You can't write a check and just, all right, problem solved. No, go do the work. Mm -hmm. Lean in and embrace the suck. And that's how we're going to get better at where we are and get to the other side of fear. With Alan, problem. thanks so much for saying that, because whenever I say that, <laughs> embrace the suck around here, for some reason, people don't like it. But <laughs> You know, John Benini told me to do that. Oh, too, he did? Right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. John Benini is, is our strategic genius behind relaunching the podcast. And he told me, yeah, this is probably going to feel pretty sucky for the first little bit, but just embrace it. Embrace the, the uncomfortable suck. work, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah right. for sure. Yeah. Alan, thanks so much. It was so, so great to meet you and good to have you on the podcast. Yeah. Really good to see you again. Likewise, Brennan, Amy, always, as I've told her and I'll share with everyone else, you have my unconditional loyalty. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks, Alan. Did you enjoy this episode? Find more at RevOpsChampions.com.